Okay, Warren, go ahead. <laughs> okay, Tim, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> no problem. Well, it's a joy to be uh, with you all. I bring greetings to you from the uh, Bitterroot Valley in Montana. And um, it's a joy to speak with Randy Hoffman. We were together for a conference two weeks ago, and it's always a joy to connect with Randy. And I've uh, benefited greatly from his ministry. So we're really looking for the Lord to bless us this uh, weekend. And I will be taking up the life of Abraham. So if you would like to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11, that's where we're going to start. Uh, obviously, we have four sessions together and would not be able to cover every chapter from chapter 11 through chapter 25. But what I'd like to do is think with you uh, on four in our four sessions together on some very practical aspects of God's working in Abraham's life. And I'm hopeful, hopeful that this will be beneficial to us. It's interesting that often scripture gives us a outline for a particular portion. And in this case, for the life of Abraham, we have this little phrase after these things in Genesis 15, 1 and also Genesis 22, 1. And I believe that divides the life of Abraham into three sections. And so we see God dealing with the man of faith in a very public way in chapter 11 through chapter 14. And then in Genesis 15 through 21, the Lord is dealing with Abraham in a private way, a very personal way. And so uh, that leads us into the final section. We have the phrase after these things in Genesis 22, 1. And the Lord deals with his servant in a prophetic way. Those all start with P, so they're kind of easy to remember. A public way, a personal way, and then also a, prophet, a prophetic way. I'll take one uh, session in the first section where God's dealing with Abraham publicly. That will be tonight. We'll be looking at Genesis 12 and first array thoughts in chapter 13. And then tomorrow we'll take and Sunday morning, we'll take sections out of that middle portion where God's dealing with the servant privately, in a personal way. And then Sunday evening, we'll close by uh, looking at Genesis 22 through Genesis 25. All right, so what do we know about Abraham? Both James and Isaiah tell us that Abraham was a friend of God. Joshua tells us in chapter 24, verse 2, that he was a pagan in the land of Ur when God called him. Uh, God uh, is sovereign. He, he chose Abraham. He knew Abraham would respond to his offer. Stephen tells us in, when he gives that little Old Testament survey in Acts chapter 7 that the God of glory met with Abraham. We only read that one more time in Scripture in the Psalms. And so the God of glory met with Abraham, Abram at that time, a pagan in the land of Ur, and will give him uh, an incredible opportunity, which we'll look at in just a few moments. He's going to be promised a, a land, a people, a name, and so forth. We also know, Paul says that he's the father of all spiritual seed in the book of Romans chapter 4. Uh, he's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. He's the a great man of faith. Uh, he's called a pilgrim and a stranger. Pilgrims belong where they're going. Strangers don't belong where they're at. And Hebrews, uh, Genesis 14, he's called a Hebrew, which means a passenger. He's just passing through the land. And so, as we'll see this weekend, Abraham wasn't a perfect man, but he did please the Lord because he uh, had exemplary faith. And chapter 11 of Hebrews brings that out so well. God calls him to a land. Um, Abraham didn't ask where, he just went. He tells uh, him later that he and his wife, past childbearing age, were going to have a son. He doesn't ask why. And then in Genesis 22, when God tells him to offer Isaac up as an offering, um, Abraham doesn't ask why. 
He doesn't ask the how for the birth of Isaac. He doesn't ask the why for the sacrifice of Isaac. And this is clearly uh, just the, the kind of faith that God is pleased with. All right, so with that introduction, that started in Genesis chapter 11. Uh, we're introduced to Abram's family. And I apologize, I'll probably say Abraham a few times in this early section. It's hard to go back and forth. He's Abram at this time, which means exalted father, although he doesn't have any children. And Terah is his father. Terah had three sons, we read in verse 26, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Uh, but Haran died before Abr Abram left the land of Ur. We read that in verse 28. Abram and Nahor take wives. Abram marries his half-sister. Nahor marries his niece. But there's a problem in verse 30, Sarah was barren. She had no children. Verse 31, then Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, his daughter-in-law Sarai, and the son Abraham's wife, his son Abraham's wife, and they went out with them from Ur, of the Chaldeans, to go to the land of Cana, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. We'll pause our reading there. Now, it's my understanding that when we get to chapter 12, verse 3, that God speaks to Abram in Haran, and he's repeating what he uh, said to Abram when he appeared to him in the land of Ur. So, Let's go ahead and read the first three verses of chapter 12, and then we'll go back and start drawing some application from the text. Verse 1, now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So that's what the Lord uh, promised Abram in the land of Ur when he appeared to him. Now, as we look at the text, though, it wasn't Abram who led his family out of Ur to the land that God had promised Abram. It was Terah, his son, or his father, excuse me. And so Terah is the one leading this expedition, leading the family out of Ur, and they go up to Iran, about 600 miles to the, the northwest of Ur. A God did not want Abram's family to go with him. The promise, the covenant was with Abram, not his family. He didn't want any influences, pagan influences on Abram. Uh, he was choosing Abram for a, a covenant, a special relationship, and he was not to have any reliance on anyone else. He was to rely on the Lord alone. So one of the first points that we can draw an application is that partial obedience is still disobedience. Abraham left Ur, but he wasn't leading the way. It was his father, Terah, that was leading the family. And then secondly, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Now, if you go through the rest of Genesis, uh, you can figure out that they were actually in Haran for five years. When I was writing, studying and writing my commentary on Genesis, I worked through the numbers. I thought, I haven't read this in any other commentaries, but then I read Matthew Henry and he had came up with the same uh, length of years. Uh, this is very interesting. Tara's name means delay and Haran means parched. So in application, when we delay obedience, we're going to suffer a parched life, spiritual, being spiritually parched. Um, anytime that we're not doing the Lord's will, we're resisting him, uh, we're outside of his blessing, um, he can't endorse, he's not going to bless what's against his will. So two practical points. And these are things we teach our children. They're things God's teaching us as spiritual children. Uh, partial obedience is still disobedience, and delayed obedience is still disobedience. So after Terah dies, 
the Lord comes to Abram and says, um, he doesn't appear to him because Abram hasn't been obedient. He says, get out of your country. So he repeats what he told him in the land of Ur. A country is going to be, a land's promised him. Uh, he's going to have uh, a nation after his name. His name will be great. And uh, one of the aspects of this that we can delight in is that all families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is a direct descendant of Abraham. So through him, through this covenant of Abraham, uh, we have the blessing. Actually, it's interesting, I serve um, the, the book, The Coming uh, Messiah by Robert Anderson he works through the years and he shows that this covenant with Abraham is really the central hub of the Old Testament. Up to this point, uh, we've covered about 2,055 years from creation to the covenant with Abraham. And Sir Robert Anderson then places another 200, 2,055 years to the uh, crucifixion of Christ at Calvary in 32 AD. Now, I don't know if those years are exact or right. It would be 41, 41 BC for creation and 32 AD for Calvary, but it's pretty close. And it just shows that everything is rotating around this covenant with, with Abram. The Messiah would come from it. The nation of Israel would come out of it. And not all this covenant has been fulfilled. The Israel is still being oppressed by the Gentiles. They haven't come into the full boundaries of their land given in Genesis chapter 15. Uh, and so there's certain aspects that haven't been fulfilled yet and where those will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. His name is great. He's mentioned in 27 books of the Bible. And even today, half the world population, that being Muslim or Jewish or Christian, would recognize the name Abraham. So his name is great. Well, uh, Abraham or Abram at this time listens to the Lord and he departs Haran to go now to the southwest down into Cana. This is going to be about another 400 mile trip. Altogether, Abram and Sarai and Lot, his nephew, traveled between 1,000 and 1,100 miles in order to get to where God wanted them. It says, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. You might mark that in your Bible. Three times in these next couple chapters, we're going to read that Lot went with him. Lot was a follower. He followed the spiritual man. It's interesting, his name means to cover. And he really was a camouflage, if I've used the term camouflage Christian. Uh, Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2 refers to Lot as righteous Lot, apparently because Lot went with Abram and he understood that, that the God of glory had made a covenant with Abram and, and uh, he believed that it was puted to him for righteousness. And so he's righteous Lot, but he was a carnal believer. Uh, he was a camouflage believer. He didn't live for the Lord, and it cost him everything. Actually, the three people that we've been introduced to, we have Tara, who was really a faker. He didn't enter into the promises of God. We have Abraham, who is faithful, friend of God. And then we have Lot, who is a follower. And uh, there's really three classes of people today those who don't enter the promises of the Lord, those who do, but don't live in light of them, live carnally, and then those who experience God on a higher plane through faith. And that's what we're going to be learning about from the life of Abraham. It says Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So Terah died at um, 205 years of age, verse 32 of chapter 11. That means that Terah was 130 years old when Abram was born. It says that in verse 5, that Abram took Sarai, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered 
and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go out of the land of Cana. So they came to the land of Cana. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth trees of Moray, and the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. The Lord did not appear to Abram again until Abram was obedient. He appeared to him in the land of Ur, the God of glory, gave him this promise. And then the Lord appeared to Abram again once he had been faithful. And it's a reminder of, of us, the Lord talks about in John 14, 15, if you'll love me, um, you'll obey my commandments. And then verse 21, he repeats the same thing, but it says that he will manifest himself to those who are obedient. And so this is uh, the benefit of going on with the Lord and yielding and obeying him as we get to understand more of him. Uh, it's as if the Lord is saying, here's what I want you to know of me and obey. And when we obey that, he says, okay, and I'm going to show you more of myself. And when we yield to that, he says, okay, I'm going to show more. And he just draws us in deeper and deeper through a yielded and obedient spirit, a humble spirit. That's something that we're learning from the life of Abraham. So God appears to him. Uh, this is holy ground. Uh, he's moved to worship, and Abram builds an altar to the Lord. This will be the first of many altars. Uh, Abraham had never built a house. He was nomadic. He pitched tents, and I don't think he had his tent pegs pounded too far into the ground. Uh, he was just passing through this world as a Hebrew, as a pilgrim and a stranger. He wasn't investing in a world that was under judgment. The book of Hebrews tells us that God had revealed to him about a heavenly city, eternal city, and he was living in light of that. And we do as well. So he builds an altar. Uh, he, pitch, he lives in tents. It's a, it's a life of separation. And a life of separation is essential to be a worshiper of God. And that's another little uh, tidbit that we can glean from the narrative. Then we find out that Abraham moves. It says he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So apparently um, he was near Bethel or at Bethel, which means the house of God when the Lord appeared to him. But then he moves um, away from Bethel and towards Ai, pitches his tent again, and he builds a second altar. Now, I don't directly fault Abraham or Abram for doing this, but there's a great application here that we can draw from the text. Bethel means a house of God. Ai means a pile of rubble. And when we withdraw from the presence of the Lord, our lives are just going to enter into a pile of rubble. The, the safest place is under the wing of the Lord, in, his, in the secret place, resting in him, drawing from him. I believe all beneficial spiritual exercise occurs when we just rest in the Lord. And so moving away from the presence of the Lord, God's house uh, is something that's inviting difficulty and trouble. So far, we've learned that partial obedience is disobedience, delayed obedience is disobedience, and not staying near the Lord has consequences. And often our lives end up becoming a pile of rubble when we, we don't stay near the Lord. Well, the there's a great famine that hits the land. I believe it probably occurred within a year, maybe two years after they first came. Uh, and so this is their first test. Uh, Wearsby says, Faith that's not tested will not be trusted. Testing of our faith is absolutely necessary. God knows where we're at, but we don't know where we're at unless we are tested. And so it shows us where we're at, shows the what's lurking in our hearts, what needs to be repudiated. So there's a famine. Abraham doesn't consult the Lord. 
uh, he just figures the only way I can get out of this situation, this hardship, is to go down to Egypt. Egypt is a symbol of the world throughout Scripture. It's really the intellectual world. Uh, Sodom uh, re reflects the sensual world. Babylon would be the religious world, but Egypt is the intellectual world. And so we have um, Abraham, Abraham going down to Egypt uh, to escape the famine. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Now, what wife would not like to hear those words, right? I mean, he starts out well here, but therefore it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister that it may be well with me for your sake and that I may live because of you. Well, this is um, clearly a poor character bent with our man of faith. Again, he's not a perfect man. Um, he, he seems to have a fear of losing his life. Actually, later, uh, he tells um, Abimelech when they're at Gerar that when they left or wherever they wandered, he had asked Sarah to say this. You're a beautiful woman. I'm afraid that when the locals see you, if they know that we're married, they're going to kill me so they can have you. And so be well with me. Just tell them that you're my sister. Well, that had to be a terrible thing uh, for a wife to hear. But in ancient Eastern times, um, that was just the, the way things were in the society. It was a hardship. And the deepest need of the woman is security and significance. And for the husband to say, I would rather you be abused than me die is a terrible thing to say to your wife. So it was a half truth. They had the same father, but they didn't have the same mother. But Abram clearly wanted everyone to believe the wrong side of that half truth. So verse 14, it says, when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, why is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Well, God's intervening. Abram, Abram does not do what he should up here. Uh, and lying is never endorsed by God. Uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that believers are to put away all lying or to tell the truth in love. And so scripture does not endorse lying, even though this is a half truth. It's being posed as a, uh, a lie. It's being posed that Sarah is not Abram's wife. The Lord intervenes and he plagues Pharaoh. Pharaoh understands something's up here. This is supernatural. The timing seems to be evident. And he puts two and two together and he returns Sarai to Abram, but not without a strong rebuke. Now he makes restoration to right the wrong, but uh, Pharaoh was more noble in this matter than, than Abram was. So, this was a very expensive trip for Ab Abram. He goes down to Egypt. I think his marriage is affected. Lot gets a taste of Egypt, the pagan culture that he can't ever shake. It seems to guide his carnality the rest of his life. Um, they come 
up with a servant girl named Hagar that's just a little bit too available a few years down the line. And one of the saddest parts is there's no altars in Egypt. Uh, it wasn't the land of promise. It wasn't where God was going to have fellowship with Abram. And so the whole time that Abram was in Egypt to try to fix his problems, he wasn't having fellowship with the Lord. And by the way, that's the fourth point. Diverting in the world to fix problems always makes things worse. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. Not staying near the Lord has consequences. Diverting into the world to fix our problems never works. And so this was an expensive trip. And the last thing is they came out of Egypt with a lot of stuff. And we're going to learn in chapter 13 that when the Lord's people have a lot of stuff, they don't get along so well. So it says that Abram went up from Egypt. Before verse 10 of chapter 12, he went down. That's the same terminology used in the book of Jonah. Jonah went down from uh, Gath Hefer to Joppa. He went down into a ship. He went down into the bottom of the ship. He, then he gets thrown overboard. He goes down to the bottom of the ocean. Things didn't turn around until uh, he came up out of the, the ocean as the well spits him out. And then it redirects his life. Going down into Egypt is never going to resolve problems. Abram comes up out of Egypt in chapter 13, verse 1, and things are going to turn around for him. Notice again in verse 1, it says Lot with him. Lot was a follower. It says Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. This is the first mention of the word rich or riches in Scripture. I'll try to bring out some of these first mentions as we go through the text says he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. But then notice this, to the place of the altar which he made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. I love this. It, it gives us the fact that Abram retraces his steps. He goes back to the place between Bethel and Ai, but then he goes further back to the place he built the first altar at Bethel and calls on the name of the Lord. What a great application. None of us are perfect. Uh, we all uh, falter from time to time. It's not falling that makes us a failure. It's staying down, wallowing in self-pity, not learning from our mistakes, not... Uh, getting up, repenting with, with before the Lord and receiving grace to go on in his strength. That's what God wants us to do. A failure is someone that just stays down. Abraham goes to the place where he got off the tracks and he gets right with the Lord. And perhaps there's someone listening today, you've been away from the Lord. Go back to where you got off your the tracks with your relationship with the Lord and... Um, Call upon the name of the Lord, and he will forgive, he'll cleanse you, and re fully restore you. And we see Abraham's not restored to a lesser position than what he had before. He's learned something through his mistake of going down to Egypt. Now, the rest of the text is, is quite lovely. The key word in this section is separate or separation, separated. We see it in verse 9. We see it in verse 11 and verse 14. And what we're going to see is there's... Lot, Abram have a lot of stuff when they came out of Egypt, and so they, they're not getting along very well. We read that there was conflict uh, in verse 7 between their herdsmen. It says, and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and Persezites then dwelled in the land. So Abram said to Lot, please, let there be no strife between you and me between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. This is a, a wonderful example of humility. It's Abram that has a whole title deed to the area of the land, not Lot. They have a lot of stuff. They're not getting along. 
the more stuff that believers have, it is chokes the life, the spiritual life out of us. We often don't get along because we have a lot of stuff. It it's, uh, divides our affections, our attention, our resources. And Abram, he said, when he looked at the Canaanites and Perizzites, it, it bothered him. He keenly felt the fact that they had a poor testimony in their community. There not, should not be disunity among the brethren. And so Abram says, we're brethren and uh, we can't have this disunity. You take, if you go left, I'll go right. Uh, but we can't have this conflict. And uh, I just love the way Abram handles this. Uh, he sacrifices his rights in order to maintain unity that there isn't conflict among the brethren. And that is something that we should do as well. So it's the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2. Lifting the interests of other people up, putting our interests down, uh, being others-minded, and not exalting ourselves. That's the mind of Christ, and that's what Abram is demonstrating to us. He's willing to give up his rights in order that there might be peace among the brethren. And that's something that we should consider doing. Well, Lot lifts up his eyes and he saw all the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zor. When Lot lifts up his eyes in the text, he's always moved to carnality. Uh, he got a taste of Egypt that he couldn't get out of his mouth. He looks towards the east. He sees a Jordanian valley. It's well watered. It reminds him of Egypt. He says, that's where I'm going. We'll find out it's quite different when Abram lifts his eyes. There's a whole different... Uh, reality to the spiritual man when the spiritual man lifts up his eyes being led by the spirit versus the carnal man being driven by his lusts. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Cana and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. So he looks up, he sees Sodom, he moves towards Sodom, he pitches his tent in Sodom. By chapter 19, we see that he's sitting at the gate of Sodom, probably had a leadership position in the city. When the carnal man lifts his eyes, is driven by his senses, his feelings, and moves uh, because of, of what he's uh, lusting after, he loses everything. And we see that everything that Lot thought was really good in this chapter, he loses it all in chapter 14. Um, God is gracious and restores it back, and he still doesn't leave Sodom, and so he loses everything in chapter 19. And we even see his daughters marrying the Sodomites. It's uh, Lot was a carnal-minded man, and it cost him everything. Abram dwelt in the land of Cana, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And that's where Lot chose to raise his children and to make home. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see, I will give you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, and I will give it to you. Then Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees at Mamre, which are in Hebron, and he built an altar there to the Lord. This is his third altar. So there was separation from the world, came up out of Egypt. Here we see he's separating from the, the carnal man that brings peace. And 
God at that time reaffirms his covenant to him. He says, you look every direction, Abram, it's all yours. It says that God said, lift your eyes. Three times we read of Abram lifting his eyes up. It's always in response to the presence or the word of the Lord. And the outcome is always a blessing. I think of David when he, in the Psalms, where it says he, he lifted up his head to and saw the rock that was higher than, than him. It was a desperate time. And when we look up in faith to the rock that's higher than us, we're always going to find peace and God's blessing in the situation. Abraham was a worshiper, and so he, he builds an altar. So as we're looking over these uh, two chapters, it's wonderful gleanings, wonderful practical things that we can apply to our own life. Uh, remembering that delayed obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Not staying near the Lord has consequences. Uh, we end up being, a, our lives end up being a pile of rubble without the Lord's presence. Divi diverting into the world never will fix our problems. It just makes things worse. The more stuff we have, the more opportunity there is for to strangle the, the spiritual life out of us and also to, to have disunity. We also saw that if when we fall, we go back to the place where we made the mistake, get right with the Lord, get up in grace and keep going on. The Lord is for us. Um, we need to be willing to set aside our rights in order to uh, have peace among the brethren. And that's something that Abraham, uh, Abraham shows us in chapter 13. And then that's not be ever be lifting our lives up in lust, looking at what the world values and thinking that somehow we're gonna have the blessed life. Abraham lived the consecrated life. And when he lifted up his eyes, it was always in response to the presence of the word of the Lord and there was blessing. So these are some wonderful applications as we continue on in the text. I would love to talk about chapter 14 and 15, but we're not going to have uh, time to do it in this conference weekend. So if you want to read ahead, we're basically going to be looking at chapter 17 and uh, mostly 18 tomorrow night. I'll make some cursory thoughts on, on chapter 16. And we're going to be thinking about what does the blessed life look like? And in Abraham, we're going to see uh, four aspects of living the blessed life. And uh, they're the same things that we can enjoy with the Lord today. Father, I want to thank you for this text. I want to thank you for Abram, your man of faith. And Lord, well, clearly not a perfect man. None of us are perfect, but we're thankful that you uh, keep, you love us too much to leave us the way we are. You keep uh, moving us heavenward in our thoughts and our actions, conforming us to the the image of your son. We're thankful for this work of the spirit in practical sanctification. We pray, Father, that if there's anything in our lives that we're not obeying completely, uh, we're delaying uh, obedience, that you would just show it to us. Uh, we don't want to quench your spirit. We don't want to uh, grieve your spirit. We don't want to suffer the loss of fellowship and fruitfulness. Uh, having a fruitful fruitful spiritual life. So we pray that you would show that to us. Father, it's clear that when we stay in your presence, we're going to be greatly blessed and uh, enjoy communion and fellowship with you. So we pray that we would not think we can get some satisfaction or have our problems resolved by leaving your presence and going into the world, uh, that we just stay near you and trust you in these things. Pray, Father, too, that we would be willing to take the low place in order to have peace among our brothers and sisters. Lord, I, I just pray that each of us would uh, really be moved by your spirit to look up at the, the great God that you are, the all-knowing, all-seeing, 
God, a God full of love and mercy and compassion, tenderness. And Father, that we would fully commit ourselves to you. There is rest in your presence alone, a blessing. And we pray, Father, that we be like Abraham, living that consecrated life, seeing that consecration leads to deeper worship. And that's what we want to be, oh God, is worshipers and truth led by your spirit for your honor and glory. Father, we ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.